we're in the home stretch here. Uh, next up, we have Devin Elliott, who's going to be talking about 3D printing design and possibilities. Devin Elliott researches magic illusions from the turn of the 20th century, working on a PhD in history at the U University of Western Ontario. He's also interested in making robots, lasers, and radio. Sounds like a potentially dangerous combination. Welcome, Devin. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Devin and I wanted to tell you a little bit about 3D printing, how you can design in 3D and share some ideas about its usefulness as a technology beyond purely design or engineering. So what is 3D printing? 3D printing basically heats up plastic through a tiny nozzle and it creates a shape layer by layer from a digital design. The orange platform moves in two directions for your X and Y axes and in this case the extruder moves up one step at a time for the z-axis. The printer that I use is a MakerBot. This is a do-it-yourself kit that fits on top of your desk. It's open source, but a kit costs just over a thousand bucks. It goes together easily and it consistently prints. So you can be up and printing within a day or two of receiving the kit. There are other options though. Uh, the RepRap project is focused on developing 3D printers that can print parts to make more 3D printers, basically self-replicate. Uh, Fab at Home is another design out of Cornell. They've got some really neat materials that they print with the nozzles pictured there. Now, along with the accessible technology, accessible design tools are available. Google SketchUp is free and versatile for building many models that can be printed out in 3D. I use it for most of the things I've made. Uh, a plug-in has to be added to export STL files, but that's really easy to do. Uh, you can design objects uh, by using shapes, then push or pull them to the dimensions you want. Or there's a handy measurements box on the bottom corner where you can put exact dimensions just by typing them in. Now you can share your designs on Google's 3D warehouse. Uh, you could find models built by others that you could use as is or as a starting point in customizing your own designs. Um, this is what was available for London, Ontario uh, last week and it wasn't very much. Um, Thingiverse is another user-driven community that is built up around 3D printing and making. This is a, another great resource to get designs and to share those that you've created. It's community-oriented. You can get the design files um, of many different objects on there, and the site renders them, that second picture down on the screen, so you can see what the, the model looks like. Um, it has opportunities for users to like models, and they can join in the discussion, as well as create links between different models. Um, you don't need your own printer to get into this. Print-on-demand services are out there. You can send them your models and pay to have them printed and shipped to you. And there's also options to make your models available to others as a commercial venture where you can, anyone can go to the site, purchase a model, get it printed and sent to them. Now, working in 3D has really changed the way that I think about many topics related to my historical interests. And it can likely change the way that you think about your interests as well. You'll end up thinking it with objects. As an example, this is a church that no longer exists anymore. All I had was a photo from a website shown. Still, with that photo, it can be a starting point to creating a model in 3D. Measuring the door in the photo, I used that as a rough scale to begin with and generate a digital model. Later, I could actualize that model with the printer. Imagine reconstructing models of old streetscapes. The digital models inherently contain a lot of data about size and proportion that can now be returned to the physical world. More 3D models would be more useful data. Again, 3D printers aren't necessarily needed for this. The material isn't as important as the model. Other tools are available that would allow you to turn these digital forms into paper models, for instance. Now, to take a local example, um, you, we can look at historic sites. So they could be rendered and made available to the public via Google and not only contain aesthetic characteristics but also information about size and proportion and location. Digitally, one could zoom inside of this model and look around. So images from the actual building, they could be taken and used as photographic layering for the interior of the digital building. Um, this could be like a high school project, for instance, where they could essentially use historic information to build or curate the inside of a historic building. Uh, they could make available parts of an existing structure that can't normally be seen by the public or recreate forms that no longer exist. The decisions would have to be justified historically and they'd be engaged in a form of historical thinking. So the technology has become accessible and affordable and it opens the door to thinking with objects. Uh, what could you do with these technologies with your own interests? 
or in the context of this series, how can they be extended toward building communities? Now, much of my work on this is via the Lab for Humanistic Fabrication, led by Professor Bill Turkel at the History Department at the University of Western Ontario. So you can check out information on this site to see what we're up to and some of the tools we're using. Or you can feel free to contact me. Uh, there's my contact information. Um, thanks for all your time on all of this. And if you'd like to see some of the printed models, I brought some with me. So feel free to say hi afterwards and check them out. <laughs>